I've just come straight here from the cinema after watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutagen Mayhem and I kind of hated it. Okay, okay, maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh. There were some elements of the movie I did actually like. Unfortunately, there weren't many. First of all, I really did like the animation. It reminded me in so many ways of the Spider-Verse movies. It's got that similar kind of animation to it, but it's also got this other kind of hand-drawn painted animation to it as well, which it flips to back and forth throughout the movie. Secondly, the way the Ninja Turtles were designed, I was fully on board with. I actually like the designs of these Ninja Turtles. I like how they all had their own different look to them. Um, how Michelangelo was smaller, Raphael was bigger, Leonardo was taller. I didn't like how they gave Donatello glasses, I didn't like that in the Michael Bay movies either. And I didn't like how uh, Raphael had the whole headband on his head. But these weren't big problems for me, I could get over that, that wasn't an issue at all. It was the actual plot of the movie. And it wasn't only the design of the Ninja Turtles I liked, I also liked the design of Bebop and Rocksteady and all the other side characters, all the other villains. I liked April O'Neil. I weren't too fussed about Splinter. I didn't think he looked quite right. I think the perfect Splinter for me is either in the um, 1987 uh, cartoons or in the 1990 movie or in the 2012 animated series. I think he looked fantastic in that. In this, I weren't really on board. Although I will say this, Jackie Chan does play a good Splinter and there were some amusing bits in the film involving Splinter. There are a few emotional scenes in this movie as well that really do hit home. We've seen it in many other Ninja Turtle movies where the turtles feel like outcasts and they want to be involved more in society. And in this film, they really do get it right and they really do pull at your heartstrings. You really do feel for the Ninja Turtles in this. They get that right. Unfortunately, it's the rest of the movie that just didn't work for me. I also saw this movie in 3D and I've got to say it's one of the best movies I've seen in 3D for a long, long time. I went seeing the new Avatar film not long ago and I was very excited to see that film in 3D because the first one was brilliant in 3D. I just didn't get the same experience that I got with the Ninja Turtles and you would have thought it would have been the other way around. But Ninja Turtles for me offered the best 3D experience. You really did get that, that feel of depth in all the scenes. Okay, so when the movie starts, we see a squadron of soldiers making the way to Baxter Stockman's hideout, his lab, where he has been turning animals into mutants. And first of all, he's created a fly into a mutant fly. So in this, Baxter has created the fly mutant. Baxter Stockman wasn't actually the fly mutant himself. When the soldiers break in, a fight starts between the mutated baby fly and the soldiers resulting in a fire breaking out and an explosion and Baxter Stockman dies. Whilst the building was ablaze, we see a stray canister of TCRI ooze fall down into the sewers. We then fast forward 15 years and we see the Ninja Turtles jumping across rooftops on their way to collect some groceries. And it's at this point that we hear the Ninja Turtles talk for the first time. Leonardo, I like the voice. Raphael, I like the voice. But Donatello and Michelangelo, I wasn't completely sold on. You think there are people who will accept us? Our dad is definitely not a giant rat. As the movie progresses a little bit, we get to see Splinter for the first time. And like I said before, I'm not a massive fan of the design of Splinter, but some of his scenes are actually quite funny and Jackie Chan does do him justice, he really does. The only problem is the origin story that Splinter goes on to tell is a little bit underwhelming to say the least. Straight away, they've gone with the origin story of Splinter just being a rat to begin with, and he has no association whatsoever with the Shredder, with the Foot Clan, nothing. He's just a rat, and straight away I had a problem with this. I always do. I like Splinter to be a man who mutates into a rat. It just makes more sense for me. Um, I know in the 1990s movie, which is my favourite, he started off as a rat, but I kind of excuse that because the film is just so good and they stuck to the origin story of the comics. In this, he's just an ordinary rat who lives on the streets, who's hated by human beings, so he kind of gets this hatred for human beings himself. And he finds the Ninja Turtles in the sewers covered in the ooze, and he takes care of them, gets the ooze on himself, and then turns into a rat, just like in many other stories of the Ninja Turtles. But like I said, you haven't got that association with any like Foot Clan members, you've not got any association, association with Shredder, nothing at all. He's just a stray rat. Now, as the turtles get a little bit older, he decides to go up to the surface and see if they can coexist with the humankind, but he 
quickly learns that they don't accept them, they're scared of them, they fear them and they drive them back down into the sewers and that is where he decides to stay with the turtles and not resurface. He decides that the best idea is to just stay in hiding with them. And then we get to the point where he teaches them martial arts for the first time and I cannot believe after the Michael Bay films that they've made the same mistake again, almost. In the Michael Bay movies, they teach martial arts after they find a martial arts book and Splinter reads his book and then he learns martial arts and then he teaches the turtles. In this, I was hoping they wouldn't make that mistake again. I was hoping they'd come up with something a little bit more clever. In this, he teaches them martial arts after watching martial arts movies. That, for me, just totally took me out of the film straight away. Um, at least in the 1990 movies, you had Splinter mimicking the movements of his master from his cage, which is a little bit unbelievable, but I kind of bought it for some reason. But my favourite origin story of Splinter is where he started off as a human being, like in the uh, 1987 cartoon and the 2012 animated series. I think it just makes more sense to have him as a ninja master who turns into a rat and then teaches the turtles. It just seems neater to me and more believable considering it's a film about mutated Ninja Turtles. Later on in the movie on the supply run the Ninja Turtles meet April O'Neil for the first time and a moped is stolen by a gang of thieves and the Ninja Turtles go after them and retrieve the uh, moped but before they do they get into a battle with these uh, thugs. And this is their first fight so you can't expect everything to go as planned, they can't work as a group, they are a little bit nervous about fighting apart from Raphael who cannot wait to get into the action. And they make a few mistakes here and there, but ultimately by the end of it, they've wiped the floor with all the uh, all the thugs and they get the moped back and they meet April for the first time. Now April in this version is a teenager, she's a schoolgirl, and she's got a keen interest in being a reporter. Unfortunately, her nerves get in her way and whilst trying to do a broadcast for a school, she threw up everywhere and this is a problem she's had ever since. Whenever she tries to go on camera, she throws up. This. I'll, I'll get into a little bit later, I wasn't a big fan of this scene. But then she tells the turtles that she has also been investigating a string of robberies involving a criminal named Superfly. It turns out that Superfly isn't your ordinary everyday criminal, he's actually the mutated fly that Baxter Stockman created from the beginning of the film and he's been trying to steal TCRI tech. Oh and he's also now a fully grown monstrous mutated fly. And he's also got his own army of mutated animals and bugs to help him out. I've Wingnut, Ray Filet, Leatherhead, Genghis Frog, no sign of his brothers though, Scumbug, Mondo Gecko and Bebop and Rocksteady. Like I said before, I really did like the design choices of the mutants, they really did look good and menacing, especially Bebop and Rocksteady who were fantastic in this movie. I actually liked the characters of Bebop and Rocksteady in this movie, they were a lot better than anything we've ever got before, apart from the 1987 series of course. After the Ninja Turtles do a little bit of investigating, they discover that Superfly isn't actually a human criminal He's a mutant and he's got this old group of mutants with him as well and they're happy about this because they didn't know that any other mutants existed, they thought they were alone so they kind of go along with them for a little bit. It's only when they realise that Superfly has this plan to weaponize the ooze and release it into the atmosphere and turn all the wildlife into mutants and take over the city. It's at this point that they decide that they have to fight against them. A little bit later in the movie there's a chase scene where the Ninja Turtles are trying to escape from the other mutants and TCRI come and capture the Ninja Turtles and hold them prisoner. Whilst they're prisoner they're trying to drain all the mutagen out of the bloodstream and this is another aspect of the Michael Bay movies that they kind of took with them for some reason. They did the exact same thing in the Michael Bay movies by trying to drain the blood out of the Ninja Turtles. I found it quite strange that they tried to copy this plot point once again. But luckily April O'Neil headed to the turtle lair and told Splinter exactly what was going on and he turned up and took out a squadron of soldiers using his ninjutsu skills that he learned from kung fu movies. <laughs> After their escape from TCRI Splinter joins the turtles and tries to stop Superfly. They also succeed in convincing the other mutants to go against Superfly and join forces with them. This includes Bebop and Rocksteady, which at first I was kind of okay with. I, I, I couldn't see this happening in any other version of the Ninja Turtles, maybe in the 87 version. I think they teamed up with them now and again. 
but ultimately at the end of the episode they will be villains again and they will be against them. We'll get back to this a little bit later. So now as a joined force the Ninja Turtles and the other mutants go up against Superfly and they succeed in stopping this plan. Unfortunately it gets covered in more ooze and he transforms into this big whale slash fly creature with all these other animals mixed in there as well and he's about the size of a Godzilla and he heads for the city. So the turtles, be bopping up steady and all the other mutants to stop Superfly from trashing the city. When they get there, they're not doing a very good job, they're basically losing. And on top of all this, all the people of New York are against the Ninja Turtles because it's been broadcast on TV that they are also the enemy. Luckily, April O'Neil manages to get on camera and tells the entire city that the Ninja Turtles are actually there to help them. And with this, all the people of New York actually join forces and help the Ninja Turtles take out the villain. It really did remind me of the ending of Spider-Man 1 when all the people of New York came together to help Spider-Man. As a team, including the people of New York and the Ninja Turtles, they defeat Superfly. And then, at the end of the movie, it's decided that all the mutants and the Ninja Turtles should live together in the turtle layer. This includes Bebop and Rocksteady, which I had a lot of trouble accepting because, to me, they're villains. But in this, they're all friendly at the end and it's all like a one big happy family. So yeah, I just was a bit surprised that Bebop and Rocksteady ended up being the friends by the end of it and they all lived happily ever after in the sewer together. But then Splinter and Scumbug actually started a relationship together and it was, you know, Scumbug's like this disgusting, grotesque, like inf insect and Splinter's this rat and they're kissing each other and it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible to look at, to be honest. It turned my stomach a little bit. Um, just like the vomiting scenes with April O'Neil, I weren't on board for that either. As the movie ends, we see the Ninja Turtles being accepted into society and starting school. They take off the bandanas and they start their day at school and everyone accepts them and it's quite a happy ending. It just doesn't feel right though for a Ninja Turtles movie. It just doesn't feel right to see them accepted into society. That's not how a Ninja Turtle film should be in my book. Maybe one day if there's a few movies down the line to finish the movie franchise, but not straight away. I don't honestly know where they're gonna go from here. And if you stick around for the after credit scene, you will see that the Ninja Turtles and April are enjoying prom night at the school, but they are also under surveillance from TCRI, who has decided to enlist the help of the Shredder. Like I said before, the design of the movie, the design of the characters, I really do like. It's got this strange quality to it. Like, none of the characters are actually symmetrical. They always have these odd shapes here and there on the faces, like the jawline might be different here, and it might be slightly different on this side. It's not symmetrical. If you go back to the 1987 series, the, the characters that they drew for that series were really strange, so I don't know if that was in homage to that. But it's quite unique and at first it was throwing me a little bit but then I thought this is it's quite cool actually, it's quite a unique artistic style that they're using here. Another thing I didn't like about this is that there were a lot of similar scenes between this and the Michael Bay movies with the mutagen being drained out of the bloodstream, they also did that in the Michael Bay movies. The learning ninjutsu from movies was very close to them learning ninjutsu from a book in my opinion. And also there's a joke at the beginning of the film where they say Leonardo's putting on the Batman voice um, in the Michael Bay movies, they said that Raphael is putting on the Batman voice and I just thought it was quite strange that they used the same joke twice out of both films, out of films that the fans don't like. The fact that Splinter wasn't associated with Amato Yoshi or that he wasn't actually Amato Yoshi at some point kind of takes me out of it and I just can't believe that they were taught ninjutsu from watching films. <laughs> Um, that's one problem I have with a lot of versions of the Ninja Turtles. Like I said before, the 2014 series got it very right. They really did do a good job with that series. One thing I did like is that the Ninja Turtles actually embodied teenagers more than they ever have done in any other film. Obviously, teenage is in the title, so they are teenagers. In every other film, they were teenagers, but they kind of acted like adults. In this. They were actual teenagers and they made April O'Neil a teenager as well and she had her insecurities and the Ninja Turtles had the insecurities and it kind of brought them together and that was a nice aspect of the film as well. One thing I didn't like about the April O'Neil scenes was when she was actually nervous about being on camera. They showed this by her vomiting all over the desk and it was quite... 
I'm not squeamish, but it was quite gross. I, I just thought it was too gross for the movie and it kind of put me off a little bit and it put me off the character, to be honest. It was overdone in the film. They could have... They could have maybe had a vomiting, but then the camera cut away and you just heard it, but no, you saw it all. And later on in the movie as well, when she goes in front of the camera and tells New York that the turtles are friendly, she actually does it again. And it, yeah, it kind of just grosses you out. Like I said before, another bit of the movie that really grossed me out was this love relationship between Splinter and Scumbug. Now, Scum like I said, Scumbug is this disgusting insect with like horrible things coming out of his mouth. Now, even though we got Shredder right at the end of the movie in the end credits for a split second, I really do think this film would have benefited more if Shredder was in it from the beginning. If we got a film that was more loyal to the 1987 cartoon, maybe. I know we got the Michael Bay one, but I don't count those. If we got something that stayed along the lines of the 1987 cartoon and the Mirage comics, I think that would have been brilliant. But unfortunately, they went a different way. That's not to say that a Ninja Turtle film that doesn't revolve around Shredder and Krang and Dimension X and all that kind of stuff won't work. Just look at the uh, TMNT movie that they released. That movie was brilliant and that didn't really revolve around Shredder or Dimension X. And that film was fantastic in my books. It's probably one of the best Ninja Turtle movies to date. But this movie, I think, would have benefited more by sticking to one of the more original origin stories, having Splinter as a man who turns into a rat, or having Splinter have some kind of connection with Amato Yoshi, with the Foot Clan, I think would have really done it a lot more better. I think the film would have been better if Shredder was in it, if they'd have included Krang in it as well, and just had it more along the same lines as the 1987 series and the Mirage comics, I think it would have benefited from that, because as fans, we've all wanted that for such a long time. And even when the 1990 movie came out, let's face it, we were all disappointed that Krang, Bebop and Rocksteady weren't in it. We'd never heard of the Mirage comics, we'd just heard of the 1987 cartoon. And we wanted Bebop and Rocksteady, we wanted Krang, but we didn't get it. But that film was so good, it didn't really matter to us. We loved the film anyway, and the film got so many elements right. Fast forward to the Michael Bay Ninja Turtles 2, where they include some of these elements, and I must admit, I did get a kick out of that film a little bit, but they still didn't get it right. And let's face it, Shredder has not appeared in a good Ninja Turtles movie since 1990. I mean, sure, yeah, he was in Secret of the Ooze, but he was very watered down for that film. That film was very heavily censored, and violence was cut out of it completely. Shredder just kind of stood there in the background and then eventually we got the CGI movie where Shredder didn't appear at all in it and then we got the Michael Bay movies where Shredder was in it but in my opinion he was just a Transformer that wasn't Shredder it would have been good to see this movie just bring all the old favourites and put them into it and make a really good Ninja Turtles movie maybe one day we'll get that but as for this movie I think they did make a good attempt to make a good movie. I just, in my opinion, it fell flat. And at the end of the day, that's just my opinion. There were elements of this movie I did enjoy. I love the animation style, I love the character design. You know, it, it could have been a lot better than it was. But like I said, that's just my opinion. Maybe you enjoyed it. If you did, let me know in the comment section. If you didn't enjoy it, let me know in the comment section. And be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. Until next time, See you later.